Well, today we're going to be learning about roots and zeros, and these are our content standards and our mathematical practices we're using today. Previously, you've used complex numbers to describe solutions of quadratic equations. And now we're going to determine the number and type of roots for a polynomial equation and find the zeros of a polynomial function. So previously you've learned that a zero of a function, f of x, is any value, c, such that f of c is equal to zero. So when the function is graphed, the real zeros of the function are the x-intercepts of the graph. And so here we're going over, and you've heard me say this before, that zeros and factors, roots, and the x-intercepts, we're talking about the same thing. So in solving a polynomial equation with a degree greater than zero, there may be one or more real roots or no real roots because the roots are imaginary numbers. Now since real numbers and imaginary numbers both belong to the set of complex numbers, all polynomial equations with a degree greater than zero will have at least one root in the set of complex numbers. This is the fundam fundamental theorem of algebra. Every polynomial equation with a degree greater than zero has at least one root in the set of complex numbers. Let's look and see what this means. So we're to determine the number and the type of roots. So we notice we have a quadratic here. We're going to factor this one. And notice we have two solutions, negative 8 and 6. So this equation has two real roots, negative 8 and 6. This one's different now. We've got y to the fourth. So let's solve it. We got a difference of squares here. Notice we can factor the, the difference of squares, but we cannot factor a sum of squares because we'll end up with a middle term. So we set each of these equal to 0, y squared plus 16 equal to 0, y plus 4 to equal to 0, and y minus 4 equal to 0. And then solve for y. We're not quite done here. Uh, we have to take the square root of both sides. So y is equal to plus or minus 4i. So this equation has two real roots, the negative 4 and the positive 4, and two imaginary roots, positive 4i and negative 4i. Okay, let's check your progress on this one. So pause the video for a moment and work the problem, then come back and check your answer. This was pre pretty easy to factor, wasn't it? x minus 4, because different signs, the largest is negative, and x plus 3. When we set them each equal to 0, we end up with two real roots, negative 3 and 4. Okay, so let's try this one. Pause for a moment, come back and check your answer. Okay, so I factored this to begin with as a squared plus 9, a squared minus 9. Then a squared minus 9 factors to a plus 3, a minus 3. Set it all equal to 0. The a squared plus 9 comes out to be plus or minus 3i. So there's two imaginary. And then the um, positive 3 and negative 3, two real. <clears throat> When we examine the solution for each equation in that first example, notice that the number of solutions for each equation is the same as the degree of each polynomial. The corollary to the fundamental theorem of algebra describes the relationship between the degree and the number of roots of a polynomial equation. This says a polynomial equation of degree n has exactly n roots in the set of complex numbers, including repeated roots. So x to the third has three roots to the fourth has four roots, to the fifth has five roots. Additionally, French mathematician René Descartes discovered a relationship between the signs of the coefficients of a polynomial function and the number of positive and negative real zeros. Now, we're to state the positive number of possible number of positive real zeros, negative real zeros, and imaginary zeros of this polynomial. One quick tip. If a zero of a function is at the origin, then the sum of the number of positive real zeros 
negative real zeros and imaginary zeros is reduced by how many times zero is a zero of the function. Okay, with that given, let's look at Descartes' rule of signs. So it has a degree of six, so it has six zeros. However, some of them could be imaginary, so we need to count the number of sign changes. So looking at the original polynomial, we keep the signs with it, notice. Okay, so now let's look. From a negative to a positive, yes, it changes. Positive to a negative, yes, it changes. Oh, negative to a negative, it's not changing here and it does not change here. So we notice on our polynomial it changes signs twice. So since there are two sign changes, there are either two or zero positive real zeros. Now let's find uh, the function for negative x and we'll count the number of sign changes. So all we do is in, put a negative x in place of the x Okay, so we've got no sign changes here, none here, oh, there's one sign change, two sign changes. And this is a trick, you need to keep your negative x in your parentheses, but one thing you can look at, a shortcut method, if it's to an even power, when it's negative, it changes it to a positive, so in essence your sign will not change with your term. But if it's a negative, I mean, if it's an odd exponent, when you go for a negative x, it changes the sign. So you could quickly do that without having to stop and think. So there are two sign changes. So there are two or zero negative real zeros possible. So we're going to make a chart of possible combinations. Okay, we know there have to be a total of six because our polynomial was the degree of six. We said there could either be two or zero positive or two or zero negative and so we we group it together say that there was two positive and two negative well we have to have a total of six so that leaves two imaginaries what if there was zero positive and two negative well that means there would have to be four imaginary to make the total of six again we go back to a possible two positive and here we go with the zero negative <clears throat> we're trying out every possibility so that means we'd have to have four imaginary for our total of six. Or if we had zero positive and zero negative, we'd have to have six imaginary zeros in order to total the number of zeros, uh, complex zeros. <clears throat> okay, so check your progress. You'll need to uh, solve for p of x and p of negative x and know how many zeros you're looking for. So pause for a moment and come back and check your answer. <clears throat> okay, so for positive you could have 2 or 0, negative 2 or 0. So for imaginary you could either have 4, 2, or 0. Very good. Now we're going to use synthetic substitution to find zeros. You can use the various strategies and theorems you've learned to find all of the zeros of a function. So we're going to put some of those together. First of all, we notice that this function has a degree of 3, so this function has three zeros. Now we need to determine the possible number and type of real zeros, so we're going to use Descartes' rule of signs. So we're seeing how many cha sign changes we have. So it looks like two positive. Now let's look at the negative. One negative, okay? So two or zero positive and only one of the negative. Thus the function either has two positive real zeros and one negative or two imaginary and one negative because we've got to have a total of three. So we're going to list some of the possibilities uh, for synthetic substitution. Uh, this is using um, like a guess and check, figuring out values for x. I like to um, enter the function into my calculator uh, to find out, look at the table to find out uh, where the zeros are. So from the table you can see that one zero occurs at x equals negative one. So we used synthetic substitution. Um, 
we find the depressed polynomial. So you can use synthetic division divided into the original polynomial to find out what your, your new result is, your depressed polynomial. Then you can use the quadratic equation to find your imaginary solutions. So this function has one real zero at a negative one and two imaginary zeros at one plus i square root of three and one minus i square root of three. When you graph the function, you can tell <clears throat> that it has exactly one real zero. Okay, so time for you to check your progress. Remember, you need to determine the number of zeros by using Descartes' rule of signs. Then you're going to determine um, the type of zeros Fix yourself a table. How many positives, how many negatives, how many imaginary. Uh, then you're going to determine the real zeros. So you can either study the table or uh, graph the function and use the calc menu to find your zeros. And use the quadratic formula to find the roots of the quadratic equation. On this I found that it had two positive and one negative. And so because all of these were either 1 or negative 1, I tried a synthetic division, and I just started with 1 and synthetic division. I ended up with a quadratic of x squared minus 2x minus 4. And so then I used the quadratic formula, and I found that my um, complex solutions were 1 plus or minus square root of 5. So previ previously you have learned that the product of complex conjugates is always a real number and that complex roots always come in conjugate pairs. For example, if one root of x squared minus 8x plus 52 is 4 plus 6i, then you know that the other root is 4 minus 6i because they always come together. If you've got a plus, you've got to have a minus. If you've got a minus, you've got to have the plus. This applies to the zeros of, a pol of polynomial functions as well. For any polynomial function with real coefficients, if an imaginary number is a zero of that function, then its conjugate is also a zero. This is called the complex conjugates theorem. When you are given all of the zeros of a polynomial function and are asked to determine the function, you're going to convert the zeros to factors and then multiply all of the factors together. The result is a polynomial function. So for instance, we're told that the zeros of a polynomial function are 4 and 4 minus i. Well, because of the complex conjugates theorem, you also know that 4 plus i has to be one of the zeros. So when you write this as factors, our factors are x minus 4, and x minus 4 minus i, and x minus 4 plus i. So we write this down, x minus 4, and then we're going to use the brackets to separate them, x minus 4 minus i and x minus 4 plus i. Now we're going to multiply them. Notice what we've done. We've used the associative property. We're just regrouping here. So we have x minus 4 squared and then i times a negative i is negative i squared. So x minus 4 squared gives us x squared minus 8x plus 16 minus, and then i squared is uh, negative 1. Do you remember that previously? So now we simplify. We're going to add 1 to 16, so we get a 17. Now we're going to distribute the x minus 4, across, multiply this binomial times this trinomial. Then combine all of our like terms. So this is our polynomial function. It has zeros of 4, 4 minus i, and 4 plus i. Okay, time for you to check your progress. So we've, we're going to write a, polynom a polynomial function uh, that has for zeros a 2 and a 1 plus i. Well, if you've got 1 plus i, you know you've got 1 minus i. So your factors are x minus 2, x minus 1 plus i, and x minus 1 minus i. Very good. Okay, you're ready to begin your assignment.